Amen. We want to welcome you today to our uh, Facebook Live uh, message for this Sunday on Palm Sunday. We want to welcome as well all of our internet audience, those that are joining us on different feeds and uh, from actually from all across the world. We're glad that you're watching this today. And I just wonder today, are you ready for the Word of God? If you are, I encourage you just to type down in the comment section, bring it on, because I've got a word for you today. So I want to encourage you to have a pen and a Bible handy, some paper ready, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 22. I also want to thank everyone, particularly those in our congregation, who are, who are sharing this message out on, on social media. And uh, so I just want to encourage you to do that right now. So if you could just hit the share button and share this to your Facebook page, I would greatly appreciate that. And uh, so I just also want to say how wonderful it is to pastor a group of people like we have here at Fountain of Life. You've been so wonderful in your, in your support, in your giving, in your phone calls. You're encouraging one another. I even had someone text me this week and ask me, does anybody that you know need toilet paper? I've got extra. I'll be glad to give them some. And so, wow, that's really the spirit of giving, and, and I appreciate that. But how many of you realize that in a very real sense that we're all on a journey right now in the kingdom? We're all passing through a difficult season, and the truth is that, that we're in this thing together. We're all traveling down the road trying to keep ourselves and our families safe during this national crisis. We're all praying, and I believe that God is going to answer those prayers. And today is Palm Sunday. It's a day when Christians normally would gather together and have a great celebration, uh, remembering the triumphal entry of Jesus uh, into the city of Jerusalem. And we can still celebrate that today uh, by worshiping him and praising him because he is the triumphant king of kings. But this morning what I want to do is I want to draw some parallels between our lives today in this crisis and the lives of Jesus' disciples shortly after the triumphal entry. Because you see, they were too, uh, they were also on a journey through a very difficult season. And I think uh, of the disciples that day as they journeyed with Jesus and they saw this triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Man, they must have been thinking, wow, the future is going to be great. And I wonder if they realized that the journey they were on would soon grow difficult, that they would soon be going uphill, it would be hard and even very tearful. Because if you follow the biblical narrative in just a few short days after the triumphal entry, you'll discover that this group of disciples who loved Jesus, who had followed him for three years, they would find themselves in a room huddled together, fearing for their very lives in there. And that's because they had seen their leader, their mentor, their savior, Jesus, die on a cross. He had been hung on a cross and buried in a tomb. And for, for the disciples, that was a crisis for them in a very huge, huge way. And as we look uh, into the Word today, we're going to discover that Jesus, who is such a loving, wonderful, good leader, he did his very best to prepare his disciples for that crisis that they went through. And I want you to see the warnings that Jesus gave to them as the, the, as the crisis approached. I want you to see as well some of the mistakes in particular that Peter and others made on the journey. And I believe that we can apply Jesus' advice to his disciples as they were approaching that crisis to our situation today. So first of all, I, I want to share with you today three mistakes that Peter and the disciples made that you and I could make during this very season. And this is all right out of Luke chapter 22. So number one, mistake number one. First of all, Peter tried to make it through that season on his own strength and self-confidence. Now, of course, Jesus understood his disciples. He understood who Peter was and and uh, he understands who we are, and, and he understands that in, in, we have to understand that in spite of our weaknesses and our personality quirks, 
Jesus called us just like he called Simon Peter. And so he understands Peter and he understands you. And he knows you even better than you know yourself. And I want you to picture today Jesus and Peter in your mind. And they're having a conversation. And Jesus, of course, he knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to go to the cross, that he's going to die. And he realizes that it's going to be a crisis of faith for those uh, that are follow him. And he knows what Peter is actually trusting in. And so we're going to jump into the word here in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. It says this, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Now, when he said, called him Simon, he was actually referring back to his former name. We know that the, Jesus had given Simon a different name. He called him Peter, and Peter means rock. Simon means reed. And so he was reminding Simon, listen, don't be like a reed that's easily bent. Let's go on there. He says, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Then I want you to notice the next verse. Instead of a humble attitude at, at this, these words of Jesus, I want you to notice Peter's self-confidence. He said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Uh, he, he thought he was ready. You see, Peter had built up an image of himself in his own mind. There's a saying that we, we say that says, he was a legend in his own time. Well, Peter was a legend in his own mind, okay? He thought, I'm going to be a, a legend of stability and faithfulness. And he saw himself as a cut above everybody else. He thought to himself, you know, John and Andrew and Bartholomew and Thaddeus, you know, when things get tough, they're going to melt away. They're going to fade away, but not me. I'm ready to go with Jesus. Very interesting that actually Jesus had spoken about his death to his disciples. He had never once mentioned anything about prison. But, uh, you know, I don't know where Peter gets that. But I guess Peter was just envisioning that one day it would be he and Jesus sitting in prison. And, of course, in his mind it kind of played out like this, that Jesus would turn to him and say, You know, Peter, I knew that you would stay the course. You know, uh, everybody else failed me, but you did not. I mean, he had this false image of himself, and he was trusting in himself. But how many of you realize that before? Before this very leg of the journey would end, Peter would come to realize he wasn't as tough as he thought he was. His faith wasn't as strong as he thought it would be. And most of all, Peter had to figure out that he needed to depend upon God's strength and God's power instead of his own strength and his own self to get him through. So what I want to do today is by the Spirit of God, I want to come right down right into the place where you live, into your home where you stay, and ask this very simple question. Who are you trusting in to get you through this time? Whose strength is going to see you through this season? Because you see, any crisis will reveal to you who and what you are actually trusting in. And Peter, of course, was trusting in himself. He was trusting in his own commitment, but the crisis revealed something to him of his own weakness. And I want to tell you that the crisis of coronavirus may reveal some of our weaknesses in this next season and in this moment. But the good news is this, that in our weaknesses, we can turn to the Lord and we can depend upon him and God's going to give us the strength and faith that we need. But I want you to follow me closely today. What is somewhat true in normal times is going to be amplified in times of crisis. Now, follow my reasoning. If you are sometimes and occasionally angry on a normal day, what's going to happen when the stress builds for six weeks of staying home? It's going to amplify, am I right? Let's be honest. And if you're sometimes depressed and discouraged on a normal day, how is your flesh going to react if all you do is sit and watch those depressing and discouraging numbers keep going up on that television screen? And if, some, if sometimes you're a worrier on a normal day, how are you going to do as you realize that the very members of your family are involved in essential businesses and they're still out there and you're thinking of them and you're, and you're wondering if they're 
you're going to be saved. It's easy to slip over in the constant stress and worry. So I'm asking you today as your pastor, how are you handling this season? And what's going on on the inside of you? Because you see, people are finding themselves in brand new situations that produce a lot of stress inside of them. And you see, many of us have built up an image of who we thought that we were before all of this happened. In fact, if we would have had a Bible study with lots of Christians and we would have passed out a survey and told them that this crisis was going to unfold, almost all of them would said, I'll be fine, I'm strong, I'm not fearful, I can handle anything. But then guess what happens? For the first time, there are married couples that are staying home together 24-7, day after day. And what happens is the walls feel like they are kind of closing in on them. And the stress starts to build. And pretty soon the tension in the family, it, it can boil over. So how do you handle the stress? And, and I love some of the memes that are out on social media today. Uh, the one that I thought kind of pictured me was was uh, they, they pictured two people. The first guy over here is looking all tough and fit and strong, completely muscular. And then the second guy, you know, he's obviously gained uh, quite a bit of weight. He's carrying a lot of pounds with him. And the meme says, me before stay-at-home order and me after stay-at-home order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, that can be true. I mean, and this is stressful for people. I mean, can you imagine an entire family trying to work at home online? One spouse is in the kitchen online. One is in the living room online, on the couch. And, and one is on a conference call, and he needs the room to be quiet so he can hear. And the other has to make phone calls, and they're constantly talking. And, and all of that begins to grate on one another. And then let's really complicate the situation. Let's put a couple of kids in there. So not only do you have to work from home, but somehow in the midst of all of this crisis, you've got to take on the huge role of homeschooling your own kids. Wow, that, that's a, that's a, that is a recipe for stress. One dad put on Facebook after one day of homeschooling, how can I get my son transferred out of my class? Another meme said, I, I saw my neighbor out scraping the bumper sticker off her car that said, my daughter excels at so-and-so elementary school. You know, someone's going to realize that they could make a mint in online family and marriage counseling during this season. So, so what I'm saying is that not only is, is society in a mess with this coronavirus, and it's, and it's extremely serious, and we've got to pray about that, but what is also happening is that life at home has taken on its own stress, stresses. I mean, who's going to fix lunch? And, 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 you know, who's going to homeschool the kids and, and help them with their lesson? And, and now you add that to the day when one spouse or the other or, or maybe both get their hours cut or get laid off. And now they have financial worries. And, and let's not forget about the worry of just going out and going to get some, some milk or some bread or something at the store. And, and you're stressed out. Are you going to get coronavirus? And, and seriously, there's a lot of stress in our world. And Jesus knew this. He knew that a crisis reveal something inside of us and so while we have this image of ourselves during times of crisis that man I'm going to be calm and, and I'm going to just remain full of faith what happens is the truth is we find ourselves eating and eating and eating and we find ourselves worrying and we find ourselves stressed out and we find ourselves feeling sad and we find ourselves feeling like we need to escape somehow and, and we, we find ourselves slipping into kind of a, a feeling of depression and we discover that we're not really as strong as we thought we were but listen I've got some good news for you today if some of these things are happening in your home and in your life. Listen, this is what Jesus told Peter. He said in Luke 22, 32, he said, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Wow, Peter was blessed because Jesus was praying for him. And I want to tell you that you're blessed because he's praying for you. Because Hebrews 7.25 says this, he always lives to make intercession for them. I'm just here to tell you that God, that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father and he's saying, he's interceding for his church and for his people right now, asking God to give us the strength that we need. But you see, Peter was determined that he could just walk through that season on his own strength and Jesus had to tell him, 
In Luke 22, 34, he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster's not going to crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. And I'm sure Peter was thinking, no way, that's never going to happen. I'm going to go with you all the way. But what happened was they came to arrest Jesus. And kind of to make a long story short, Peter followed from a, from a distance. And he went to where they were keeping Jesus. And there were many people there that evening. And Peter was gathered around a fire. And three different times people accused Peter of being a part of Jesus and a part of his clan. And three different times he denied him, even cursing to prove it. And so I'm here to tell you that sometimes a crisis reveals what is inside of us. We think we're going to be giving and yet we find ourselves hoarding. We think that we love our neighbors and yet we feel a kind of an irritation in the grocery store. When the guy right in front of you grabs that piece of uh, whatever it was that you were hoping to get on that day. And uh, you, we think we care about people but man what happens when somebody violates that six foot cube and I just let you in on something this morning, and this is the truth. You can take it to the bank. It's real. We cannot live the Christian life on our own. The scripture says this, without him we can do nothing. The truth is we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, especially in times of crisis. And so we need to start adopting this type of thinking today. We need to say it is okay for me to be dependent upon God. It's okay for me to get up in the morning and go to the Lord in prayer and confess my struggles to Him and confess my feelings to Him. And, 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 and we need to pour it all out to Him and say, Lord, I'm feeling a little discouraged today. I'm feeling a little weak. I'm feeling a little angry or depressed. And Lord, I just need you to take all of this and lift it up off of me. And I'm going to tell you today that if you'll cry out to the Lord, He will do that. And not only will He lift that off of you, but He'll fill you with the things that you're really looking looking for. Come on, he'll fill you with faith. He'll fill you with hope. He'll fill you with love. He'll fill you with a, a sense of peace down on the inside because you're going to make it through this thing. I love Psalms 46 and verse 1 that says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. It doesn't say you have all the strength that you need. No, it says you've got to depend upon God who is your refuge and who is your strength. And he'll be there to help you. And I tell you in this season, more than ever before, we're going to have to learn how to wait on God. We're going to need His strength. We're going to need His courage. We're going to need a daily infilling of His Spirit and of His power in our lives. I love Isaiah 40 and verse 29. Because it says this, He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. You might be thinking, I don't know if I can make it through this. I don't know how I'm going to ever make it through. Listen, this is what the Word says. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They're going to run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And I'm telling you that if you'll spend time with God, if you'll spend time in his presence, you're going to walk right through this crisis out onto the other side. And God's going to protect you and be with you. And you're going to say, wow, God help me through this. But listen, don't be self-confident. Be God confident. And so when stuff is building up on the inside of you and you're about ready to send their, your kids to their room in a fit of anger or you're worried about the rents or you're fearful for your loved ones, Listen, don't try walking through this on your own strength. Be willing to say, God, I need your help today. Will you bring me through this? And I can assure you that he will. Then there was another mistake some of the disciples made. Secondly, Peter forgot that Jesus was their source of supply. I have never noticed this in Scripture before. And I tell you, I have read this passage numerous times. But Jesus is preparing his disciples for the crisis that's going to follow after he's crucified. And after warning Peter not to trust in his own confidence, I want you to notice the very next thing that Jesus says. Jesus, knowing that a crisis is imminent just around the corner, this is what he says to all the disciples. Luke 22 and verse 35. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, Knapsack 
and sandals? Did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Jesus was referring back to Luke chapter 10 when he had sent the 70 out. He sent them on a journey, and this was his advice. He said, listen, don't take money. Don't take a knapsack full of stuff. Don't even bring extra sandals. I'm going to take care of you. And the scripture tells us that all 70 of those who were sent out in that manner, they came back rejoicing. Why? Because they had seen the provision of God. And they even came back saying, even the demons, Lord, are subject to us in your name. But I'll tell you, not one came back from the journey and said Jesus you didn't supply what I needed you failed me I did what you said I didn't take money or food or sandals and now I've come back from my journey and I'm broke and I'm hungry and I'm barefoot no sir they discovered something that God was faithful and God had supplied all of their needs and Jesus was saying to the disciples as they faced an imminent crisis don't forget that But you know what I think? I think that they did. And I think Peter led the pack because shortly after the crucifixion and even after the resurrection, this is what Simon Peter did. It says in John 21 and verse 3, he said to all of his disciple buddies, he said, I'm going fishing. Hold on a minute. You've been called to fish for men and now you're going back to fish for fish. And they said to him, hey, we're going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. (laughs) They caught nothing. In their attempt to provide for themselves, in their attempt to go back to their old life, they, they didn't have very much success. And of course, if you know the rest of the story, it's really incredible. It's unbelievable. Jesus is on the shore. They don't recognize who he is. And they've been out fishing all night, and they haven't caught anything. And, and so Jesus calls out to them, and he says, look, how's it going out there? Do you, have you caught anything? And they say no. And he says, just put your net over there on the other side. And they cast it out. And immediately the net is completely full of very large fish. I'm just here today to tell you that when you make Jesus your source, he said, I will supply all of your needs by his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Late February, I went to a conference. And at that conference, I learned a new song. I'd never heard it before. It's called The Goodness of God. And one of the lines of that song says, all my life you have been faithful And I sang that song at that conference with tears in my eyes and remembering the goodness and the faithfulness of God throughout my life. And I'm just going to tell you that that is the first thing that God wants to teach his people. God is faithful. You can trust him. You can trust him in times of famine and difficult moments and in national crisis. Doesn't matter. You can trust him. Way back in 1983, when Jareen and I started in ministry, we left on our journey without, a not, without having a whole lot. We took this church in Big Spring, Texas, and we actually lived in the back of that church in order to be able to uh, be full-time in ministry. And those of you who know my story, you know how that God provided uh, us with everything that we need during that season. He, he brought my wife just piles and piles of beautiful clothes. He provided us with a house to live in rent for a year. He provided us many times with people who brought us groceries. And he provided us with dear pastoral friends, uh, Salvador and Gloria Beale, that you know we called ourselves the rookies. And, and I'm just here to tell you, God's faithful. When we were missionaries, God was faithful, even though my son at one point, point had an E. coli bacterial infection. I'm here to tell you that he's completely well and doing great. My other son could have died of electrocution but did not. God spared his life. And so I had to ask myself this this question. Have I ever lacked anything in the years of my life? And if Jesus would have said to me, when I sent you out did you lack anything? I would have to say with the disciples, no. I have lacked nothing. And so I'm here to tell you that I I've been in training for a national crisis like this for my whole life. And I'm not going to make the mistake that the disciples did and forget who my source is. Come on. I'm ready to tell you that the first lesson that God wants to teach his people is that their source is God. Your job is not your source. Your government is not your source. Your ingenuity and abilities and intelligence are not your source. Your source is God. 
Well, you say, does that mean I have no responsibility? Of course not. In times of crisis, we're to do our very best to prepare. Jesus taught them that too. Notice what he said here in Luke 22, verse 36. He said to them, but now, but now in this moment of crisis that's soon to come, he said, he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack. And he who has a sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And, and so they said to Jesus, they said, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Jesus was saying, Prepare yourselves the best way that you can for days of crisis. But I absolutely love the way that Jesus ended that conversation. He said, it's enough. What you're going to do is going to be enough. Prepare yourself the best way. Take what you can. Do what you can. But it's going to be enough. And I just want to declare that today over the United States of America, over your home, over your house. It is is enough. I'll tell you why it's enough for you and me as believers because our source is not this world. Our source is the God of heaven. Amen. The owner of the cattle on a thousand hills and the gold underneath those hills. Man, I tell you, I'm preaching to myself this morning and needing this today. Amen. Listen, don't make that same mistake Peter did. But remember, hasn't he been faithful all of your life? as well. And then the third mistake Peter made is one that many Christians have done and I pray they're not doing right now. Number three, Peter slept when he should have been praying. He slept when he should have been praying. Now while the crisis that we face today is different from the crisis the disciples face, the principles are the same. You can't make it through any crisis without prayer. This passage in Luke 22, Jesus models uh, for us what we should be doing. Because you see, even Jesus himself on this earth was in a crisis in a sense. He was fighting that which his flesh desired. Now, of course, we know that, that Jesus was completely sinless. He defeated sin in every way. But the Bible tells us he was also tempted in every way that we are tempted. And the truth is that there was a part of Jesus that didn't want to go to the cross. And so we pick up the biblical narrative in verse 39 of Luke 22. Let me read it to you. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then he, then he sweat. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, I want you to notice what it says. It says he found them sleeping from sorrow. You didn't know that sorrow could make you sleepy, huh? I've never seen that in the word. Sorrow can make you sleepy. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Wow, what a, a question. Jesus asked his disciples, why are you sleeping? It's time to rise and pray. And, and I think today that this one who modeled so beautifully for us what to do in an hour of crisis. Listen, if Jesus had to go to God in prayer, if Jesus needed to be strengthened by an angel while he was going through his moment of uh, a, a, a passion there in, in, in the garden, how much more do you and I sometimes 
times need to go to God in prayer when we are facing a dark hour. And I believe that the Lord is saying to the church of Jesus Christ, listen, it's not time for you to feel sleepy about the sorrow. It's not time for you to just kind of let go into a spiritual slumber. No, it's time for us as the church of Jesus Christ to rise and to pray. Let me tell you something. I'm believing God that this crisis is going to produce a revival in these United States of America. I'm believing that the prayers of God's people that are, go that are going to rise towards heaven and penetrate the heavens and go right into the very throne room of God are going to stir and move a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our world today because what our world needs today is to return back to God and Jesus modeled what we're supposed to do in moments of crisis. We're to go before God. We're to cry out before Him. We're to let our requests be made known to Him and we're to intercede. We're to intercede for our family. We're to intercede for our friends and we're to intercede for this country. Listen, we need to pray for the United States of America. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray that God will protect our, 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 our health uh, workers and, and our doctors and our nurses and our police force and all those who are essential to keep everything going in this country. I'll just tell you that in any crisis, in any situation, in any difficulty, prayer is essential. Your grandparents prayed, many of you. Your parents prayed. And now it's our turn to step onto the throne, uh, step into the throne room of God. And I'll tell you something, I've made a decision that my voice is not going to be quiet. As I meditated on this passage this week, I thought of Peter. I thought, what if he would have just pushed himself to the point where he was awake? What if he would have stayed up and prayed all night with Jesus? What if he would have interceded with Jesus? I wonder, would the scripture read differently? Maybe Peter wouldn't have denied Christ three times. Maybe he wouldn't have been the one that suggested, hey, let's just go back to fishing, man. You know, this, this isn't working out for us too good. Perhaps God would have given him the strength and the scripture would read dip, different about Peter. He would have never had to go out and read those, weep those bitter tears. I'm just telling you that prayer is so important. God answers those. God answers those who will call upon him. I think of the city of Nineveh. God told Jonah to walk through that city and declare that in 40 days this city is going to be overthrown. But you know what the city of Nineveh did? They put everybody to a fast and prayer for three days. And God spared that city of Nineveh. I, I think of the days of Esther. Haman's evil plot was to destroy the Jews. And he was determined to have every Jew killed. And yet Esther and Mordecai called all of the Jews to fast for three days. It was not time for sleeping. It was time for praying. And God gave them the victory. And it wound up that it was Haman that was swinging on the gallows instead of Mordecai. And so I'm here to tell you, God hears and answers prayer. This is not a call to those who are intercessors. I know intercessors are already praying. This is a call to every single believer to not make the same mistake as the disciples did in a moment of crisis, but to step up and to rise and pray. I want you to get up every day and rise and pray. This is a new hour for the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe that we can step in it and be victorious. I believe that God is going to bring us to a place where we walk out of this we walk out of this national coronavirus crisis as a church in complete 100% victory. And that's only going to happen if we pray. Let me talk to you just for a moment. Maybe you're listening to this broadcast today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You look at the world and you're filled with fear. You're filled with terror. You don't know what's going on. Listen. The Bible tells us this, that every one of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is this, that Jesus Christ took our sins and went to the cross. And now all we have to do to become a believer is to believe in Him and trust in Him, confess our sins, repent from our sins, and begin to follow Christ. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, I want to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are listening today. 
God, who don't know you, first of all. And I pray, Lord, that they might come to a place of saving knowledge and saving faith. I pray, Lord, that they might get down on their knees today and call out on the Lord. Call out on the name of the Lord and ask for the God of heaven to save them, to write their, their name in the Lamb's book of life. I pray that they would make a determination in their heart to turn away from sin and to turn to the living God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would hear their prayer in Jesus' name. And I want you to join with me today in a prayer for our nation. Would you do that? I don't want you just to listen to this prayer. I want you to lift up your voice wherever you're at. You might be in your car listening to this, or you might be in your home in your living room, or out, or maybe taking a, a run, whatever you're doing. Listen, I want you to just stop right now and pray for the United States of America and even our world. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we pray, God, that you would send a mighty wave of healing power, God, to this country. God, I've come against this coronavirus in the name of Jesus, and I bring, God, all of the authority of the church of Jesus Christ against it and Lord we lift up our voice and we ask you Lord God to God to do whatever is necessary God to have mercy God upon the peoples of the world to have mercy upon our country to have mercy upon those God who need you and God to have mercy God and we have this virus relent in the mighty name of Jesus God, I pray that, God, that out of this time, God, would come a sovereign move of your Holy Spirit. I pray for those who are backslidden and away from God. I pray that you'd bring them close to, to you today. God, I pray that during this time, they might reexamine their priorities and their values in life and begin to put things back in order. And I pray, God, that as we come back together in just a few days or weeks, whatever it is, God, that there would be great victory in this house that we would share all all of the good things that our Lord has done during this time today. And we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast today. We love each and every one of you. We hope to see you on Wednesday evening at 7.15 for our midweek Bible study on Facebook Live. And we thank God for your presence here today. May God bless you richly.